Sherilyn A. Eiffel, passionate defender of civil rights, scholar, teacher, advocate, and author. As president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, you are a leading voice in the national dialogue on equality and civil rights in the United States. Accomplished graduate of Vassar College and our own School of Law, you launched your influential career as a fellow at the American Civil Liberties Union, then for five years as assistant counsel for the Legal Defense Fund, successfully litigated a series of significant voting rights cases. A professor at the University of Maryland School of Law for two decades, <coughs> you continue to litigate and consult on a broad and diverse range of civil rights cases before assuming leadership of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, <coughs> the nation's premier legal organization fighting for racial justice. Author of the acclaimed book, On the Courthouse Lawn, Confronting the Legacy of Lynching in the 21st Century, you have researched and written extensively throughout your career on the issue of diversity on the bench and on the nation's history of racial violence and contemporary efforts of racial re reconciliation. Sherman A. Eiffel, celebrated alumna and mentor to future generations of civil rights activists and lawyers, and I am so proud to say on this day, a former student of mine, you reflect the core values of our university as the national conversation on race and the law takes on added urgency. By virtue of the authority vested in me by New York University, I am so pleased to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to give you Sherilyn Eiffel, who will respond on behalf of the honorary degree recipients. Good morning. This is extraordinary. I wish, first of all, to thank the trustees of New York University and President Sexton, on behalf of all of the honorees, for this wonderful recognition. I'm truly humbled, as I know are my colleagues, to receive this honorary doctorate from one of the greatest institutions of higher learning in the greatest city in the world. I congratulate Dr. Lang, Dr. Lax, Dr. Michelle, and Dr. Vilcek, and all of today's award recipients. I must offer special thanks to President Sexton for the opportunity and honor of addressing you today. When we were on the bus, someone was remarking that President Sexton is a true visionary, and that is right. But not all visionaries have the courage, the energy, the commitment, and the focus to make their vision become a reality. And I celebrate President Sexton today for being that kind of visionary. I'll be brief. Graduations are wonderful occasions. Uh, for family and friends, 
Even for me, the child of a sprawling immigrant family with nine siblings and nearly 30 nieces and nephews, graduations are like many family reunions, times to reflect on how far we've come and how far we still have to go. Right now, I am channeling the spirit of my beloved mother, but especially my beloved father, who is no longer with us, and my beloved brother, who passed away last month, both of whom were diehard Yankee fans, and who right now are exalting in the heavens uh, that I'm here standing in front of the pitcher's mound on this extraordinary day. So because this is a day of celebration, um, I want to be brief, but I also want to say a few serious words. I know that you are aware that out there, just outside the ring of today's celebration, outside the cushion of today's excitement, lies a more sobering reality. And I want to say a few words about the challenges out there that await you in the world after today's celebrations. And I feel comfortable doing so because by virtue of you being an NYU graduate, I know that you are someone who is concerned with the condition of the world. I know that you are creative, imaginative, bold, an intellectual, a doer, and a natural-born activist. I know that you take the responsibility of citizenship seriously. And by citizenship, I don't refer to your legal status in a country. I mean the responsibility of membership in the community in which you find yourself, whether it is the American community or the human community. Since last August, I found myself repeating under my breath from time to time a line from a document I read in the 10th grade in my American literature course at Hillcrest High School in Queens. Queens. <laughs> I haven't thought much about this text since then, but after unrest broke out in Ferguson, Missouri, after Eric Garner was killed here in New York, after killings in South Carolina, after learning one Saturday night that two police officers had been killed while on duty in Brooklyn here in New York, after I watched my young people in my adopted city of Baltimore unleash years of frustration, neglect, and dislocation, I found myself whispering the opening lines written by Thomas Paine in his pamphlet about the American Revolution. These are the times that try men's souls. These, in fact, are the times that try men's and women's souls. The past nine months have challenged the very soul of our nation such that we cannot pretend, even as we are here filled with the excitement of this day, that there are not deep challenges awaiting us. And we should not. We can suspend reality for a few hours, maybe a few days, but then we must return to the work. The challenges we face are both personal and national. Some of you are excited today, but have no idea how you will manage the debt that you have accumulated to receive this wonderful education. Most of you have enjoyed the privilege of attending this great university and living in New York City. But for most of you, if you lived on campus at NYU, this will be the last time that you will be able to afford to live in the wonderful borough of Manhattan. Still others of you wonder about whether you will be able to find a job in your chosen field one that provides maternity and paternity leave, and that will not discriminate against you for being gay or lesbian or transgender. Some of you, despite this terrific education and having found a good job, 
will feel as though the veneer of success is stripped away as you are demeaningly stopped on a street or in your car because you are told you look like a suspect. Still others of you are struggling even now to take care of elderly parents who have little or no savings, or you cannot imagine how you will save enough to send your now infant son or daughter to NYU. Many of you are doing just fine, but you accept willingly your obligation to concern yourself with the state of our democracy. You cannot ignore that there are an increasing number of states where there are hundreds of thousands of eligible voters who do not have the newly required identification demanded by ever increasingly stringent voter ID laws. You've never been to prison, but you know that the prison population of our country has reached unsustainable and shameful proportions. You know that incarcerating two million people is a sign of American failure, not American success. You know that violent crime levels today are as low as they were in the 1960s, and yet our prison population is eight times the size it was then. You're living in a nation of staggering income inequality and have revived and entrenched racial segregation. You saw the video of Walter Scott running for his life and being shot like prey in North Charleston, South Carolina, and you feel deeply, you know without question, that our democracy faces challenges that demand your engagement and your response. You've seen all these things. You have felt the crisis that is enveloping us, the crisis of confidence in the rule of law and in our justice system, and you are wondering what your role must be. And you are right to do so. It is the obligation of citizenship to engage the issues of our day, to work for peace, to demand justice, but also to fight for beauty and art and civility and privacy and dignity for everyone. And so, on this very beautiful day, I will not relieve you of the obligations of citizenship. In fact, to the, country, to the contrary, I encourage you to nurture that niggling worry, that sense of dissatisfaction, that inability to settle and to be content with the imperfections of our democracy. I encourage your discomfort your sense that you must do something, that you must contribute, that you must make your voice heard. That is the essence of good citizenship, that bone-deep sense of obligation that you must work to improve our democracy, and to improve it especially for those who are most marginalized and most in need. And you, my beloved NYU graduates, will find your own way to make your contribution. You will teach young people. You will participate and help fix our broken government. You will make meaningful art, and you will help those without access see it, hear it, dance it, sing it. You will fight for the right of children to have a childhood free from violence you will commit yourself to finding the cure for a terrible disease or to making treatment accessible to those who lack it. You will create opportunities for good jobs. You will treat your own employees humanely. You will fight passionately to protect our precious natural environment. You will stand against religious intolerance and will fight to transform our cities. You will do the hard work of communicating with those who disagree with you, of reviving the lost art of civil discourse in which you respect the humanity of the person with whom you are in conflict. I have the advantage 
of leading an organization in which my predecessors provide an astonishing example of good citizenship. Thurgood Marshall, the first leader of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, became a brilliant civil rights lawyer and later Supreme Court Justice. What he and his colleagues accomplished was nothing short of astonishing. They changed the trajectory of a nation, and they changed your life and mine. No person in this stadium has lived a life untouched by the work of Thurgood Marshall and the lawyers at the Legal Defense Fund. So I know that it is possible to make this kind of contribution. But finally, I've come to tell you something that I would not have been able to tell you a little over a week ago. I was a passenger on Amtrak train 188 last Tuesday night. After the crash, I came to walking on the tracks away from the wreck. And what happened in the next few moments helped me think through how to balance that call to citizenship, to activism, to hard work. I immediately began to communicate with that tight band of people who really are the center of my life. You know who those people are in your own life. In my phone, probably in yours too, they're listed under my favorites. My sister, with whom I was talking when the train crashed. My husband, my daughters, my best friends. And during this time, when I was utterly disoriented, insisting to my husband that I was in West Baltimore, saying over and over again that I have my laptop. My favorites came together. My sister, the medical doctor, who helped me understand that I needed medical attention. My daughter, who dispatched her best friend, who lives in Philadelphia, to meet me in the emergency room. My best friends, who loaned their car to my husband, so that he could drive from New York to meet me in the emergency room in the middle of the night where I was so relieved to see his beloved face. And so I wish to not only call upon you to use this extraordinary education to exercise the highest form of citizenship, to fight for justice and peace and equality in our democracy, to be excellent, but I also call upon you to just as passionately nurture, tend, and cherish your favorites, the ones who, when calamity happens, will find you and surround you with their love and lead you out of the fog. You must decide explicitly to do the work of nurturing those relationships just as carefully and intentionally as you must decide to do the work of citizenship. On behalf of my fellow recipients of the honorary doctorate from the New York University School, I congratulate you. I thank you. Who will follow? You will follow. Congratulations.